Thanks, LinkedIn, for inviting me. This is really a, a great honor and pleasure. Uh, as Ken said, uh, I'm uh, the Chief Privacy Officer and GM of Data Systems uh, at Intellius. Uh, I, I blog at uh, jimadler.me. I tweet uh, at Jim under Adler. And so if you want to dig into a lot of the uh, areas I'll be touching on today, go there. So a little bit about Intellius. So for those that don't know, uh, Intellius is a direct to consumer provider of information about people, businesses. Uh, we feel that it's important to discover each other, helps you make better decisions. Relationships are built in what we know about each other around public data. Uh, we're a pretty good sized site, Comscore 100, 11, 11 million unique paying customers. We power people search for Yahoo and for AT&T. Uh, most roads around people search lead to us, okay? So uh, I know this is a, mi a mixed audience uh, around data and policy, uh, but I thought, I thought I'd talk about what is the big data people search problem. Uh, we take billions of records and we block it into names. Uh, there's people that have very unique names, like, like Gwen Fleming uh, has, has a very small name cloud, and Carol Brooks, very common name, has a very large name cloud. There's 1,250 people uh, with the name Carol Brooks, and little Jim Adler has 37 Jim Adlers in the United States, and we have around 200 records for that Jim Adler. And then it's a clustering problem. So we cluster the, every node here is a record, public record in our database, and then these things cluster up. There's 37 clusters here. Uh, this is an ambulance chasing lawyer, Jim Adler from Houston, Texas. My, uh, the bane of my existence online, he's way high on Google uh, search results than, than me. I'm way down on the first page. There's little me down here, Jim Adler from Redmond, Redmond Washington. So that's the people problem. Uh, and that's what Intellius does. A little bit about me, I'm not an attorney. Most privacy officers are attorneys. I'm not an attorney. Uh, I'm much more of a geek, nerd kind of uh, 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 gene pool. Uh, some say high functioning, uh, but hard to know. You, you be the judge. Uh, one thing I, I think it's important to inform this talk about sort of where I come from, because this is really about uh, how we get our arms around privacy. And I think the point of departure, like all young people, and in 1985 I graduated, uh, since all my age is public record, I, I have no qualms about sharing that with you. Uh, on the Monday morning, January 27th, I showed up for work at General Dynamics Space Systems Division in San Diego. And I was uh, charged, and my team was charged with putting our liquid upper stage booster inside the space shuttle. And uh, it was a great for a kid coming out of college to work on the space shuttle, put a liquid, liquid uh, upper stage in the shuttle, it was awesome. The next, the following Tuesday, January 28th, the shuttle Challenger blew up. And everything was on hold for the next six months. And we were sort of just parked. Our team was parked. And we followed, of course, very intently, the, the subsequent uh, Rogers Commission investigation report around the Space Shuttle Challenger investigation. And uh, a gentleman emerged, many of you know, uh, by the name of uh, Richard Feynman. He's a Nobel laureate in physics. And he initially didn't want to be on this commission. And his wife convinced him to be on the commission. And she said, you know, there'll be a bunch of people, mostly guys, I think Sally Ride was the only woman on that commission, uh, in a knot running around. And there'll be one mosquito looking for the answer. And that will be you, Richard. And sure enough, it kind of turned out that way. They all went to meetings and briefings. And he started to really dive into it. And at a famous Rogers Commission meeting, they all went around the room sort of discussing uh, their findings. And uh, he famously talked to uh, the idea that the solid rocket motors and the stage of those solid rocket motors had O-rings around each stage. And the intent of the O-ring was to block any hot gases from those uh, uh, solid rocket motors from escaping. And if you remember, maybe many of you don't, I do, uh, it was a very cold morning in that January that the shuttle blew up for Florida. It was like, it was, it was around freezing. And he said that basically on that very cold morning, those O-rings lost their elasticity. So it took them more, like he said, more than a second for them to spring back. And during the meeting, he actually had the O-rings in ice water. And he actually pulled them out and showed the, the lack of uh, uh, elasticity that those O-rings had. And, 
for a, a young kid, a very impressionable uh, youngster, I, I just thought that was just amazing. So here's a guy who is just a physicist. I mean, just a physicist. He's one of the greatest physicists of, of all time. But, you know, he, he knew nothing about, uh, about rockets. He knew nothing about uh, the bureaucracy of Morton Thiokol and NASA. He knew nothing about that. And he came in. And for those of you who read Richard, Richard Feynman's books, you know, he always said, you know, I always ask a lot of dumb questions at the beginning when I, when I start to look at a field, because I'm building a model in my head, and then I usually figure it out, and I ask, then I can ask one zinger question uh, that really uh, extrapolates uh, the, the base of knowledge, and here he did that. And it really struck me that there are these eclectic generalists that could really inform very disparate fields. And I, throughout my career, I've sort of been collecting them in my pocket, uh, and, and there's a bunch of them. Feynman, of course, in physics. Uh, Noria Oga, uh, he was the, uh, the president of Sony uh, in, in the 70s. And he was a, uh, uh, a huge opera buff, in fact, an opera student. And he mandated that the compact discs, the CD, hold 74 minutes of music. And he, and he did that uh, for, for a, a very important reason. Uh, Beethoven's ninth would fit in 74 minutes, and he didn't want to change the CD. And I, that also struck me as here's somebody who knows music, he's influencing technology, and he brought these two things together and really changed the way, at least for 30 years, roughly, uh, how we listen to music. And I, and I think that uh, there's a, a bunch of people who, who have done the same. I think, I think what Zuckerberg did with real names and Facebook really propelled them. Uh, uh, immeasurably. Uh, Jeff Jonas has done a lot of great stuff with big data, as many of you, you know. Uh, and Steve Jobs, of course, enough said. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting. He, my, famous, my, my favorite Steve Jobs quote is, Microsoft has no taste, but not in a small way, in a big way, right? And, and basically what he means is there's no culture that's infused into their products. Right? And that's obviously, it took a, a, a much longer time for Steve to win that race. But when, in retrospect, we look and say, wow, there's a lot of culture inside those products. And that really informs uh, how we bring technology into our culture. And so I, I think that really helps us to talk about privacy. So this is sort of my evolution of privacy chart. Uh, we started in innocence, we moved to this frontier, we're in a, a stage of regulation, and, I think we're, and then I think our way out of this morass is innovation. Uh, props to uh, Austin Allman, who did this drawing for me. He's a student at, at Santa Clara University, friend of my son, Quinn's, and uh, college kids are great if you can get them to work for you, because they work really hard and tireless, and uh, they literally do work for food. Um, frontier, let's talk about the frontier of where we came from. Uh, this group, I think, will know a lot of this, but I think it helps calibrate. Uh, 167 terabytes in the surface web, just storage, right? This is probably a little dated. Uh, and just to calibrate this, that's about 40 million King James edition Bibles. I like uh, religious metaphors with privacy because it's such a passionate subject. If you look at the deeper web uh, storage, right, in databases, it's uh, quite a bit more, 20 billion Bibles about 500 times more. Uh, if you look at it another way, and this was, uh, has been studied as well, not just data that's stored, but data that's transmitted and duplicated from the dawn of civilization to 2002, about 20 exabytes of data were moved, stored, transferred, a lot more. We did 4x that in April of this year. April was a short month. Lots of reasons, right? Uh, so, this is a, these, uh, so we collect use cases in Intellius. These are why people do people searches. A lot of really odd uh, uh, reasons. I mean, some obvious, you know, parents checking out their, uh, their kid's fiance. That's one that we, my wife and I may be uh, engaging in a, in, a, in a few years. Uh, uh, lawyers needing quick access to court records. Uh, airplane, airlines looking for people, uh, owners of lost luggage. Uh, this one I love. Uh, we have a data analyst that works for us, and a few years ago, uh, every data analyst that comes in, we had them do a presentation uh, uh, of how they might look at our data. Two years ago, she did a search on Intellius because her dog needed a, tr a, a bone marrow transplant, so she needed to find the, uh, the owner of her dog's sibling. Right? So she went to Intellius to find the owner of her dog's sibling so that, dog, that owner could be contacted and that dog can be brought into a, mar a bone marrow uh, transplant procedure. 
I don't think the marketing guys would have thought of that one. Uh, so there's a lot of good reasons, right? I mean, this is a Pew study from 2008, it's a little dated now, but a lot of people find a lot of benefits, uh, ease and convenience, portability and sharing around the data uh, and social media, but there's some real concerns, right? I mean, you know, people don't like when their data is sold, they don't like photos used for marketing, uh, they don't like ads, right? The whole behavior ta behavioral ta targeting uh, uh, hullabaloo that's going on right now is an issue. And we have to figure out how we deal with that issue. So a lot of people say the internet's dead. There's no way that the internet and privacy can coexist and we're all done, privacy dead. I do not believe that. I really do not believe that. And I'm gonna tell you why. So if you go back a little bit, let's like go back 150 years. Let's not just go back before the internet. Let's go way back. You, towns were a lot smaller, right? And everyone knew everyone's business, right? There's a famous Norman Rockwell painting that talks about sort of the telephone that goes on within a small town. I love that Oscar Wilde quote. The only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about at all. And population densities were low. And anonymity was low. Privacy expectation was low. In fact, a reasonable expectation of privacy is actually a legal standard. And the, my problem with that is both Reasonable and expectation are not really tied down too tightly. They move with societal norms. And I spent a, 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 some time growing up in, in Greensboro, Alabama, and I think now the population is 2,500. I think then it was like 1,400. If you cut school, the whole town knows by dinner, right? And, and I think that we had, a long time ago, we sort of didn't have this high expectation of privacy. And then as cities grew, uh, anonymity grew, and this is over the last hundred years, privacy expectation grew. And those things don't come down so quickly. And I think now, with the advent of social media, I, I talk about this idea of privacy vertigo, that the, it's like the rug is being pulled out from under us, and we're having a hard time with it. And you see it uh, really express itself in some interesting ways. One is um, the NIMS wars that's going on around Google Plus and Facebook. In fact, just this week, uh, Salman Rushdie, there was a New York Times piece about Salman Rushdie was pissed off because Facebook canceled his account because he's really Ahmed Rushdie, I guess. And, and, and it just, it seems like a lot, much ado about nothing. Uh, but I think the point is for data people, what was the first thing I thought of? I wonder how many people use more than one name, right? So I went through the Intellius, Intellius Corpus, a couple hundred million people, and I looked at how many people use more than one name, just to sort of level set here, is it? 30%, 40%, no, it's 17%, right? Use more than one name, right? And a lot of them, I'm sure, are women and, and uh, you know, that, that are, have been married multiple times. And I thought that was a, uh, certainly a minority, but it was a, it was a pretty big minority, 17%. That's like 40 million people in the United States. And so I published a, a post on this, and it got pretty summarily flamed by a lot of people. And the, the, the feeling, that was, was really unearthed here was that, oh, Jim's trying to make the case that everybody should use their real name. And it really wasn't. In fact, the, name of the, the title of the post was Nims, Pseudonyms, Anonyms, All of the Above, right? <laughs> so I'm like saying we need to have a nuanced view of this. 40 million people use more than one name. I think we got to accommodate them. I think it's really important. I think there are cases where more than one name is appropriate. So, I think the people in this room that are that are and are in the data engineering field have a lot to lot to say about where we are on things like privacy and should we use more than one name in a social uh, in a social network. So let me talk about regulation because I think this really gets to the nub of the issue. Uh, I think part of the challenge is framing and. A lot of times the framing goes something like this. I have a right to privacy. I own my data, why do you have it? And I don't think those framings generally work well. I think that there's sort of three components to this. One is, what space are you operating under? Are you in a private space? Your body, your home, a private communication, a car, right? There's a Supreme Court case being heard right now, US v. Jones, that is actually uh, exploring that idea, 
Can the can the can law enforcement put a GPS tracker on your on your car for a month? Is that okay? We're figuring that out. So space is important, and the players are important. All right, Schneier said, I think a couple years ago, you can't look at privacy without actually looking at the power disparity between the players. We're talking about that, and then ultimately the consequences, because people ne aren't necessarily concerned about the data that's out there. It's how will it hurt me, right? And some of the the harms are are pretty significant and substantial. Uh, financial ruin, bodily harm. I mean, they're, when they're bad, they're pretty bad, okay? So I think it's, let, let, I wanna explore this a little bit. Let's talk about spaces, right? Public speaking, clearly a public, a public, uh, a public space and a public experience. I'm here, I'm in public, I'm being videotaped. I, I have no expectation of privacy, pretty straightforward. Voting? a little more nuanced, right? I, I know that people know I voted, so the fact that you did vote is totally public, but how you voted is not public. How you voted is very secret, and for very good reason, right? So a little nuance, it's not all that clear. There are some public spaces that have private spaces, right? Concerts, public space with private spaces, that's a good thing. Your home, Clearly private, right? Clearly private. So I started to think about this like a data geek, and I made an infographic of sort of privacy rights versus power disparity, right? And I said, okay, the idea here is that when power disparity is large, so should the privacy rights. And when you start and look at citizen to citizen, there's very low degree of power disparity. And therefore, the privacy rights are, are, are commensurately low. When you look at corporate and citizen, corporation and citizen, there's more, right? They, they, they employ you, uh, they house you. Uh, so there's more power disparity. There should, be more pro there should be more privacy rights or privacy infrastructure. Government and citizen, constitutional. Privacy guarantees. God and citizen, zero. All right? So then you look at the Constitution, which I think is, is a good, always a good place to start in the United States, and you look at, there's these two values in the Constitution that are in conflict, right? Disclosure and discretion, right? And disclosure, very neatly packed into the First Amendment, right? Speech, press, assembly, this is gonna have a repair. <laughs> uh, discretion is sort of smeared amongst sort of the Third Amendment, right? Quartering soldiers, the Fourth Amendment, search and seizure, uh, the Fifth Amendment, I would argue, self-incrimination, like you can't, they can't pull your thoughts out of your head and uh, incriminate you with them. The Fourteenth Amendment, due process, that was the basis of Roe v. Ro v. Wade, that your body uh, cannot be uh, 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 unduly processed uh, by the government. So, but it's not all that, it's really about the government and the citizen, and those are really important constitutional guarantees, but among citizens, there's no constitutional guarantees. There are tort guarantees, right? So there, other citizens can't harm you, right? They can't appropriate your name. They can't intrude. Uh, they can't uh, slander you, right? So there's certain uh, 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 statutory guarantees, but not constitutional. So it would be nice then to say, okay, we have a use case. What are the privacy implications of that? So I want to look at a few and see if we could sort of map that to this framework. Tweeting, mostly public. Let's put DMs aside, uh, direct messages aside, uh, because they're used very infrequently when they do. They always get people in trouble. Uh, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so, so tweeting, mostly public. The space is public, right? It's mostly public. The players are mostly your peers. And the consequences are somewhat uh, very clear. They're about accountability and you know, don't be a jerk. Uh, and, and because you, if you do, no one will follow you. And it, 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 there's a, a very rapid feedback loop, tight feedback loop around accountability, okay? Banking, the space is pretty private. United States, finances are very private. The players are corporations, right? The banks, your employer, direct deposit, the government around taxes, right? Consequences, financial ruin, incarceration, <laughs> right? So. That has to be very private, okay? So I, I think that that's pretty clear. 
Here's where it gets kind of interesting. Dating, shared, right? The space is kind of shared. And uh, as I said yesterday, I was at the uh, 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 Privacy Identity Innovation Conference uh, and speak on a panel, and it was about data and sharing. And, uh, and the way I, I kind of look at it is that, you know, sharing is a gateway, some say, would say gateway drug, between private and public, right? It start, things start private, and as you share them, they sort of get moved to public. And I think that's where there's always a lot of controversy, because the expectation of the user is that their experience is private, and then they wake up and it's public. And they're not clear about how they kind of slip through that semi-permeable membrane from private to public. And every time that happens, headlines ensue, if you've noticed. <laughs> and that's not a good thing. And so we're trying to get our arms around this. If you look at things that are at the ends of the spectrum, right, private banking, not a lot of controversy. Twitter, you, LinkedIn, I mean, you got most of the stuff is pretty public. People want to promote themselves. There's not a lot of privacy controversy around the LinkedIn business, right? Because it's very clearly public. People want to promote themselves, and that's a good thing. It's only when you start moving the goalposts around what's private. I think a lot of trouble that Facebook has had has been people think they're in a private, having a private experience, and they're not. And, and they, don't, they thought they were, and they're not, and uh, they get agitated, and, and, and they should. And there needs to be a discussion and rules and sort of some understanding around what is a reasonable expectation of privacy around a Facebook-type experience. Or for that matter, a Foursquare-type experience where your location information is being broadcast all over the place. All right? So the Federal Trade Commission uh, is charged with kind of overseeing the enforcement of privacy, and they're grappling like all of us, to be honest. Uh, there's these fair information practice principles which talk to uh, security and, and using information as, ex as it is expected. Privacy by design is sort of this new interesting area of baking privacy into the product, which I think for engineers has huge implications because it's not just about can I do it, but should I do it? You know, there's, I think, a lot to be discussed and, and thought about. I'm going to talk about that in a, in a bit. Uh, there's actually a provision around not requiring consent for commonly accepted practices. Uh, and and that, that makes some sense if, uh, if, if, the, if, if the service requires that uh, your data become public, you don't really have to ask again. And then in, increased transparency, I think, is a good idea. But a lot of these things are motherhood. How does it actually project onto products? And so again, uh, because I hang out with data engineers all the time. Um, I looked at uh, a confusion matrix. I'm not going to define this for you guys, but because I know you, you know this. But the basic thumbnail here is that clarity is on the diagonals and confusion is on the anti-diagonals, right? So whenever you look at trying to predict behavior to some actual intended outcome, a confusion matrix is a good, uh, a good way to sort of decompose the problem. So I looked at using a confusion matrix around policy, right? And the basic idea, what I wanted to see, do regulations really address the violations they're trying to protect us from, right? So I decompose this into data use and data access, right? Because you see a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, emotion around data access and, and not enough, I would argue, about data use. And I think that points to a fundamental policy confusion uh, uh, around, this, uh, uh, around these sorts of issues. So if you look at, again, the diagonals being clarity, you want data access regulations to address data access violations, right? And if you look here, data access, Fourth Amendment, government can act, cannot access your house. All right, data access regulation against a data access violation. Graham Leach Bliley can't access certain financial data, uh, COPPA, the uh, Children's Online Privacy Protection Act around children, uh, Electronic Commerce Privacy uh, Protection Act, uh, no, Electronic Communication Privacy Act, and that's really the wiretap law that says the government can't tap your phone and, and can't tap your communications, and actually there's a big movement to look at ECPA because it's about 25 years old. And then there's state breach laws that say if a service provider drops your data into public, they got to tell you. And I think that's an important uh, value. 
So these make a lot of sense, I think, because they're trying to stop data from moving around uh, because the violations are around data moving around. This act, the Fair Credit Reporting Act of 1970, I would argue is probably one of the, the most inspired uh, laws uh, of the last 40 years. Why? Well, it was 1970. They didn't know what data was out there, and they didn't know how, uh, how we, people would use it generally, but they, said they were very inspired in two ways. One is they said, if you're gonna use it for certain permissible purposes, like employment, like housing, right? Then, number two, you have to follow a set of procedures so that people don't get hurt by this information, right? So you have to ask to do a background check on someone if it's around uh, employment or housing. And if you find any adverse information, any information that's, that, that shines negatively on that person, you have to tell them about it, which is really good, right? Because there's a lot of mistaken identity out there and, and, and so for someone who works in, in, in with public data, uh, all public record data, it's noisy as hell, it's, it's messy, there's a lot of room for error. But, it, what, but what's so inspired about this law that says, don't hurt anybody with it. And I think that's really important. And it really was a very nuanced, I think very wise view of, of, uh, of the situation. And, but what you're seeing now, and what scares me, because data access is very easy. Right? Just stop it. Right? Don't let the information out. I'm starting to see a lot of discussion around data access regulations to stop data use violations. I'll give you an example. Ashley Payne, this is a well-publicized story, so I'm not violating anyone's privacy, uh, was a teacher in Georgia. She went on vacation, uh, Ireland, right? Guinness Stout, right? She was, and she had a few pictures taken of her drinking at Guinness Stout. She shared those, those pictures on Facebook. Someone shared them some more, and the school board got wind of these, uh, of these pictures, and they, uh, they fired her for it. And Wait, she's she drinking beer on holiday? Yes. It's Georgia. <laughs> okay? And it was a very conservative district. Okay? Should I resign right now? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know. <laughs> and, and, and so... But what's interesting is what ensued afterward, right? And so she said it was as if someone came into my home and stole the pictures out of my house and then took and showed them to the school board and they fired me. That's about half right, maybe. No one, A, broke into her home, right? So she's totally wrong about that. She brought those pictures into a shared experience, right? She shared them with someone. And so she let those out. It's the school board, I would argue, that misused that information, unless her contract, to your point, sir, <laughs> said you cannot drink whether you're on duty or not, right? And if, they, if, if her contract did say that, they, they were, then they, they are clearly within their rights. But if not, not. Just, I, yeah. Can, so, okay, ask me a so you come to a website and you do XYZ, and I use the information basically what is called right now behavior. You click on these alcohol pages, you look some more on other shops and blah, mm -hmm. blah, And I use the information to sell you an, an ad. Uh, is, that, uh, is that a problem or not? Yeah. Well, I think the question is, what is, the expect what is your expectation of privacy? Do you think you're having a private experience? Are you, is, someone, is the site that you're clicking on representing to you that you're having a private experience? No. Well, if, if, if you, think, if, if you believe you're in public, I would argue then you're in public. You know, if you're walking around town, right? I was at a Mariners game last season. I'm walking up the ramp, leaving the game. This girl's at the top of the ramp. Click, 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 click with pictures, right? I would expect in this day and age that picture would be uploaded. Someone would face use face recognition software to recognize my picture. And it would say, hey, look, Jim was at the game. What's wrong with that? Right? It's sort of the, it's, it's the, it's similar to the old small town refrain of, hey, I saw Jim at the game. Right? I mean, what's wrong with that? Depends on what I told my wife or my boss. <laughs> well, uh, but that only depend, that only uh, redounds back to you yeah. and not covering your tracks adequately enough. Right? And you shouldn't, I, maybe, you shouldn't have been in public, right? I, if you I were going to cover your tracks. I, I think the shopping experience gets more interesting if 
Thank you, Mark. So, so it's one thing to say that if I'm shopping somewhere, I have some notion of, of obviously I'm sharing the experience with the site or uh, the liquor store or what have you, but I don't really expect that the liquor store is going to, for example, publish the set of its top customers uh, <laughs> and put it on its Facebook page where the Georgia School Board will see them. That's yeah. right. And so you have an expectation that that experience is be, will be, if not private, at least discreet, right? Yeah. You have an expectation yeah. of that. And, and the liquor site should represent that to you. That, that this is a, that, I mean, unless it said, hey, everything you do on this site is public. If they did that, then there would be no issue, right? But the problem is there is, again, this sharing, which is when you're sharing your intentions with the site, they need to be very clear about, is it a private experience or is it a public experience, okay? But I, I did everything when I'm log, logging in. I'm not, I'm not uh, logging the same page as you may have logged in, because mm -hmm. I log in and I'm, some personalized content versus your personalized content. So your, is your point that you don't feel like your personalized content should be shared outside the site? Uh, or my experience or my behavior. That's right. That is being tracked and served and act by a, maybe a company that I don't like. That's right. So I, I'm totally with you. So what you're saying is, hey, I'm on this site. I am expecting them to be discreet with my behavior. And they're exploiting to use maybe a more pejorative term, exploiting that information outside, right? And that, and I don't have any expectation they'll do that, okay? Which I agree. If they do that, that's a problem. And that's why there's a lot of concern around this online behavioral advertising business model. What if they did this, though? What if they said, we're gonna give you 20% off everything in the store if we can make your buying habits public, totally public, using your name? You might agree. If you agree. But, and they're going to give you some value for that. And see, that's, I think, the problem that is begging a solution, which is, the, and the solution is, where's the value proposition, right? I mean, a lot of the couponing sites are giving people value or not. You know, we'll, we'll see. The jury's still out. But I think the promise is that they will deliver people value uh, and use that information to deliver them value, right? My wife, Robin, is here. She's a big shopper, online shopper. And, uh, and she's like, hey, if I'm getting value, they can use my data. If I'm going to save some money, that's okay. I did a post back earlier in the year that said your, your, your privacy is worth five bucks a month. And the way I backed that out is I looked at Facebook's market cap at the time, and I backed out what their margin should be to justify such a cap. And I said, wow, they got to make, and I looked at the user base at the time, and I said, ah, Looks like they got to make five bucks out of every user every month to justify that market cap. It's going to be through advertising or they're going to charge you. And, if, and I thought it was so, such an interesting solution. All they have to do is offer for you to pay five bucks a month, 60 bucks a year for how much people use Facebook. Doesn't seem like a lot of money to me. No ads, no use of data. You pay them and you can use that service or not. Or you don't pay them and they could do anything they want with your data. I think that really decouples these issues really powerfully. I know there's a lot of marketing people that say I'm nuts and it's crazy, it'll never work, but I, I, my sense is 2% of the people just notionally would actually pay and 98% of the people wouldn't and, and there would be no privacy issue on Facebook. I actually suggested that to the marketing team here at LinkedIn about a year ago. And they probably told you yeah, to pound I'm sand. Crazy. Yeah, of course, <laughs> well, <laughs> you're in a suspect company. Uh, okay, so let's talk about innovation, because I think we're kind of, you know, you guys are, are tracking pretty well around. Okay, so we know regulation is sort of necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, and, uh, and since we're in a corporate environment, I, I usually show this slide, which is sort of how, uh, how what the product life cycle sort of looks like, right? And this, is, this could be cars or data, it doesn't really matter. I mean, there's some raw material, some product development uh, that pushes out a product, some QA, there's some compliance testing, you release it and market it, right? And this thing goes around and around and around. And, and the, tr the challenge is, is that by the time the compliance folks get a look at it, way too late, right? So there's huge market uh, pressure because there's been all this investment all the way on the, on the, uh, the, one, the 12 o'clock, three o'clock and five o'clock uh, 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 processes that by the time you get to compliance, it better be damn near illegal <laughs> or else it's gonna move forward, right? 
And so I think that's where privacy by design, the, the, I think the hope and the intent is, is that the privacy function, well, you really can't read that, will be sort of baked into all aspects of the product life cycle. So engineers like you guys will actually say, will be able to say, hey, does this make sense? Is there something we can do to uh, mitigate some of the privacy concerns? And, and my hope is that by being able to decompose this thing into what space are we talking about? Is it a private or public experience? Who are the players involved? Is it citizen to citizen, corporation to citizen, or government to citizen? And what are the consequences, potential consequences? You can start to have tools to decompose this thing and sort of inform each uh, process in this product life cycle. Because I think too long engineers, and I'm totally guilty of this, is that you know, Hillary Mason's maxim, right? Math plus code is awesome, right? Wonderful thing, and I think it is awesome, right? But, you know, math gone awry and technology gone awry uh, is a problem. You know, some would say that our, our financial institutions were brought to their knees by too much math plus code is awesome. So I would augment a cor or propose a corollary to Mason's maxim, and just add a coefficient up front. You know, you get everything can be solved with a coefficient uh, of values, right? Bad values, destructively awesome, right? Uh, positive values, terrifically awesome. The challenge, of course, is values are not an easy thing to understand, often by engineers, right? I mean, you know, engineers are very focused on the product and product. Uh, the problem and technology at hand, but I, I would say that is a cop-out. I would say that it's important that we sort of try to broaden uh, our, our purview a little bit. Uh, and some of these are clearly in conflict, right? If you look at uh, restraint and connection, public and private, uh, we talked in the Constitution, the conflict between disclosure and discretion. Our whole human existence is about conflict. We have to figure out how to uh, endow our products with certain values that make sense for that situation, given the space and, the, and uh, the players and the consequences. So I started to look at food to sort of in, kind of inform, well, how did they do this before, right? I mean, we eat, we share, food, data, sure, why not? Let's take a look. Uh, you know, sort of, well, you know, I think my point of departure was, you know, the dinner table, the first social network, right? So a pescatarian digression, right? Let me tell you my point of departure. So I'm a pescatarian, right? I don't eat, I don't eat beef, I don't eat chicken. Uh, and my wife also pescatarian, but we made the decision before we entered college, before we even met, right? And so, I, so we, over the last 22 years, we've kind of uh, debated this like all the time. Right? And my decision was based on obviously a piece of data, right? Uh, if you look at a carnivore's intestinal tract, right, it's two to three times its body length, right? If you look at an herbivore's intestinal tract, it's six to 12 times its body length, okay? And of course, young, impressionable college kids said, well, you know, I don't want to spend the next, hopefully, 60, 80 years absorbing a lot of toxins as carcasses rotted in my intestine. That's why carnivores have short intestines, so they can absorb the nutrients and get rid of the carcass before it... Uh, the case, right? And it turns out that, you know, uh, humans' intestinal tract is, is around six times its, its body length. So I said, oh, that's, that makes beautiful sense, right? I got some data. I got a decision. I'm going to go with it. And I did. Uh, my wife, Robin, a little bit different. You know, she m m more humanitarian. Factory farming is inefficient. Uh, uh, there's certainly humani there's humanitarian concerns. All good reasons. But I, I find that you run out of runway with that, with that argument. I kind of come down to, well, then why do you fish? I mean, you know, these guys are cuter than these guys. Um, these guys are smarter than these guys. Why do they deserve better treatment than these guys? So I think that when you get into something as emotional as food and as charged, emotionally charged as food, uh, you run into a lot of these sorts of issues that we run into in privacy. Uh, not that anyone is necessarily wrong, but you need to bring at least the tools that you have to the game so that you can actually use tools to try to figure out your way forward. So I looked at data. Here's our data, 80 exabytes uh, a month chart. 
And I looked at food, 35,000 gigacalories a month, again, short month. And then I looked at food policy, right? As an old electrical engineer, right, I noticed that uh, the food leads the privacy, sort of like a capacitor's current leads, uh, leads its voltage, right? Because food here is in blue and privacy is in red, right? And, the, and what's the y-axis? The y-axis is my own notional political heat to scientific light ratio, right? Which means if you don't have any scientific light, that ratio blows up. If you, don't have, if you have too much political heat, even little scientific light, that ratio blows up. And so if you look at food, for example, Right back in the late 19th century, you had this sort of snake oil era, right? You had this uh, uh, food and, and, and drugs where there was no regulation at all. And then so the Pure Food Act of 1906 sort of codified some basic, basic uh, regulations around food and, and drugs. And then things kind of cooled down, actually, until after World War II. Why? Well, there was a huge amount of innovation in food after World War II. Why? Refrigeration was, a, was much more common. There was a huge amount of innovation around packaged foods. And so there was a lot of concern then of, of what was in a packaged food. And there were these peanut butter hearings of the late 50s and early 60s, huge debates around how much peanuts need to be in a jar of peanut butter to be called peanut butter. And there were people that have oh, got to be 90%. Some say, well, what about 87%? Can I have 87% peanuts in a jar of peanut butter to call it peanut butter? <laughs> and some say, no, 93%. And they had like 10 years of back and forth until finally they, someone said, why don't we just put the amount of peanuts that are in the jar on the label and let the consumer decide? Brilliant, right? Then we, then we had sort of 30, 40 years of labeling reform that came after that, which I think was very productive. Much less prescriptive, much more transparent, Made sense, right? And then things sort of really chilled down until genetically modified foods have sort of heated things back up again. And I would argue because there's not a lot of transparency there, which I'll talk about in a sec. So privacy, kind of similar, right? Delayed, right? Ro the FTC was actually founded uh, in 1914, actually coming out of the robber barons of the 19th century. Really, was the FTC was founded to actually stop antitrust, but its its mission grew to privacy and uh, things cooled down uh, after the FTC was founded, but then heated up around civil rights. Uh, FCRA was in 1970, as I talked about. Things cooled down, and now they're heating up again. And you see this, and why, why do I say it's heating up? I was on a panel uh, in San Diego a couple weeks ago. Uh, the Professional Liability Underwriters Society. These are, the, these are the people that underwrite corporate insurance, and they're nervous, right? <laughs> because a lot of people are getting sued for privacy. A lot of class actions, right? I think 10 in the last eight months, big companies, Fortune 500s. And so there's a lot of negative energy here. And I have this theory, conservation of negative energy, it'll go somewhere. And if we don't figure it out at the, products, at the product stage, the attorneys will figure it out, or the legislators will figure it out. And as you move down that track, it gets uglier and uglier, and there's more and more collateral damage. So I started to look then, okay, so, what do we learn around like transparency, for example? Uh, the problem with like GMO and the, you know, genetically modified foods is because I don't think the reason there's heat here or that, that, that heat to light ratio is high is because we don't have enough transparency. We don't know if GMO is really what we learned in high school around Mendel's peas and genetics. Is that really what's going on here? I mean, I think we have some questions. You know, there's, there's not enough transparency. And transparency is a great thing. Right? If you look at any, every E. coli outbreak, there's a big news story. If you look at any uh, breach of data, there's a big news story, and there should be, because then it allows us to be informed and move. So transparency is a good value, you know, kind of circling back to what value should we care about? Well, transparency, hard to go wrong with transparency. But I would argue opaque transparency isn't much of a help, right? So here's a privacy policy on the left, a real one, and this, it's just as informative as this Korean food label, at least to me, on the right. Doesn't really help me. You look at a good food label and it is really, really informative. Very succinct, very informative, and really helpful. So when you look at people data, and you guys LinkedIn, it's all about people, and tell you it's all about people, social media is all about people. 
Wouldn't it be nice if there was transparency about your information online? All right, and so I want to sort of bring this down to sort of what we've been doing at Intellius around transparency and privacy by design and, and talk about some of the things that uh, we've been up to. Uh, first, I'll tell you a story. Uh, about three years ago, I joined Intellius. I did this listening tour of a lot of privacy advocates, and, and I talked to uh, Sally Applin, who's she's an anthropologist. She's been around for, uh, she's been doing product design for 20 years or so. And I met her at a meetup, uh, and uh, she said, you know, Jim, great products have both a voyeuristic and narcissistic component. And Intellius only has the voyeuristic component, right? I think you guys at LinkedIn have figured out both. <laughs> but, so we're trailing a little bit. But, but I think she was really, that really spoke to me, right? That, uh, that people need, if it's about people, they need to both be enfranchised and, and empowered with that information. Uh, and so we embarked on this design of, of what we're calling TrueRep and you can, at TrueRep.com, which actually lets you look at your own background check, right? Let's you kind of grab control and awareness of the information that's out there about you. Not that you can control every little piece of it, because some of it comes from public records. We can't go to the county and ask them to change anything, but it will give you some awareness of the information that's publicly known about you, a 360 view, right? There's some privacy controls in it. There's a free version and a paid version. The free, the free version actually lets you uh, uh, suppress your latest contact information, right? So not necessarily your whole address history, but your latest contact information. And that feature came from talking to uh, a very tough privacy advocate in the, in the domestic violence community. Uh, when I was doing a similar listening tour, she's, I, I went to uh, the National Network to End Domestic Violence and talked to Cindy Southworth, who's one of the execs there. And I said, well, Cindy, what, what can we do here? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? And she said, well, I'll tell you what you can do. You can get my women out of your data. This is very blunt. <laughs> can I, let me just finish the story. I'll get to your question. And... We start, we, I said, give, give me the list, Cindy, absolutely. You know, and and we, we have expert, for at-risk groups like domestic violence victims and, and police officers and, and judges and elected officials, we actually do, we of course do that. But then as we got into it, she's, she, it, it was clear that uh, victims of domestic violence do not like to be on any list. Even if it's for good, they don't want to be on a list. So we worked on it, worked on it, worked on it some more. She said, you know what would be really cool? Knocking out the latest contact. Because if the woman, and typically it is a woman, completely disappears off your site, the offender will just go to another site. It would be much better if the trail just ran cold and there was no indication that that contact was suppressed. I thought that was like genius, <laughs> right? And I said, oh, we got to do that. And so we embarked on not just giving it to this at-risk group, but giving it to all our customers. And I, I think that that's where you can really garner some amazing input and amazing uh, insight from your toughest critics. And, and we did just that. Uh, there's also a new feature in here which also uh, allows you to actually add a comment to your background check. So if someone pulls your background check, uh, they can actually, you can actually put your side of the story. There's a buddy of mine who has a criminal offense on his uh, background check uh, for criminal trespassing. And he said, Jim, geez, this is criminal trespassing. You know, I've jumped a fence at a Stones concert in, in college. Can't you get rid of that? I'm like, well, that's how the county reports it. But it sounds much worse than it was. And so, and, and he's right. It actually does. But we don't have control of that. So with, with we're calling it my true rep remarks, you can actually add a comment. He can actually add a comment that says, hey, this is for jumping a fence at the Stones concert in 1985. And... That will show up next to the report that gets pulled right next to it. Here's the offense, and here's his side. There's some authentication to make sure that this guy is who they say they are before they put the comment in. It's pretty cool stuff. I think it's important that people have control and some voice in the public, uh, in the public realm for, for experiences that are not private, that are not shared, but are clearly public. We need to have a voice in them. One more example, and then I'll finish up, and I'll get to your question uh, or, and, and anyone's questions. So here's another example, actually. Uh, you go to Google, you can type in a name. Chances are that there'll be an ad that pops up. And it'll say, we found Andrew Borthwick. Andrew Borthwick runs our research team at Intellius. And, uh, and, uh, and you click on that, and it'll take you to an Intellius uh, search form. And, and then you can uh, grab a people search report on Andrew. And we were working 
with Google for a while on this, and, and they had some privacy concerns. We went to the privacy community. They said, you know, it's really not that much of a privacy concern. It just saves someone a step. Uh, but we thought we knew, you know, Google was, was sensitive to it. Uh, and we said, well, what if we put the opt-out information right at the top? We even suggested putting it in the ad. They said, hey, no, put it, if you put it there, that'd be really cool, right? So if you click on this, it says, hey, is this you? Click here for privacy options. And then it goes right to our opt-out and you can then opt yourself out. So I, I think that there is another piece of innovation that actually brings the opt-out kind of closer uh, to the product experience. Again, I don't think someone in a corner office or in the, in the general counsel's office would come up with solutions like this. They would just say, fix it. Well, the fix it comes to engineers, comes to product people, comes to people that are in this room. Last slide. So innovation is a team sport. Right? And it's not just a team within a company. There's actually team members outside the team, outside the company. Critics, customers, uh, regulators. Everybody is, needs to be part of this because I think that there's a lot of confusion out there and nobody really has this all figured out. You know, privacy is no longer about just simply compliance. There's so much more to that and so much more to it than, than just the compliance. So within an organization, it's important to drive, drive influence within the organization. And a lot of these privacy problems are cross-functional. And it requires people to sort of grab hold of them and kind of push them through the organization, listen, and, and drive, uh, especially throughout the whole business cycle. And I would say, like, be a happy warrior. I mean, these privacy issues get really contentious really fast. And it's very easy to... Uh, uh, devolve into ad hominem attacks and people are evil or good. Uh, I would argue that it's much more complicated than that and it's often a cheat to sort of just shorthand your way to evil and good. Uh, a lot of these things are all about uh, nuance and, and situations and who are the players involved and what are the potential consequences. And I, I think finally, I think it's, it's really about you know, adding uh, a clarity to this confusion. I think as data people, we have a unique position here. We can actually go look at the data. We can, we're, we're sort of wired that way to say, hey, how can, how can I inform this debate with a little bit of, of data? Uh, and, and let's start with some facts or some view of the facts. Uh, and I think that you're gonna see more privacy work done by technologists like me, like you, over the coming years. I think there's no other way around it. It's not something that's just going to be a box that gets checked at the end of the cycle. No way. Uh, at least that's my firm belief. If I'm out of a job in a few years, you'll know I was wrong. Uh, but that's really what we're all about. So let me take some questions. I really appreciate uh, everybody's uh, attention and the opportunity. Let, let me just, and I'll, hang on, I'll go to you. I just want to take this gentleman's question. Well, I'm afraid I have a few questions. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so the, Sites like that one and a bunch of other sites where you know you want to pay twenty five dollars, you can get the background information for certain certain people. Are companies uh, when they're hiring people or universities or any organization, governments using those sites? That's question number one. Okay. Number two is that um, even though you said that I could go there and do something about it, there's so many of them, so many websites like that, and. Uh, and they could make mistakes. And unless I pay the, you know, $29, $99 to get the full reports, they'll be, you know, and, and, and some of them report may or may not be even accurate. Well. Right. Mm -hmm. And some, if I am doing something, it may be very damaging to me as well. So right. that's the, the point as, a, as an individual. Uh, giving it this, uh, you know, as a citizen over here, how should I protect myself? Okay, so, so two questions. The first one is, can social data be used for employment, right, uh, and school and, and these more sensitive use cases? Uh, I think the jury is still out on that. I know the FTC just made a ruling that there's a company out there that uses social data uh, for HR purposes, and they said that that was okay. Uh, so uh, I think that, but FTC is not Congress, right? I mean, you know, they, they have uh, some uh, enforcement powers, uh, but they're not going after companies for that. Uh, your second question around, is my data dirty, wrong, does it even pertain to me, is sort of 
real life. I mean, there's, there are, some of the data that's out there about you is probably wrong. I know there's data out there about me that's wrong. Uh, I think part of the vision for this true rep product was let's show people their data and, and, and let them weigh in on what's wrong. Maybe they're okay with it being wrong. Gives them a modicum of, of maybe they can hide. Uh, or if maybe they don't want it. They, I think the, the bigger issue is I don't think people increasingly are going to want to hide. I think everyone, if you look at branding, right? Branding started with uh, large companies, not small companies. And I would argue that at least in this building, branding is becoming a very personal thing. And so if you abdicate your brand space and like opt out, I think your, that vacuum will be filled by someone else. There's a guy that uh, works for me, very, very common name, very common name. He doesn't want to abdicate his brand space because someone that fills that space may have a criminal record. And he, will be, he may be a victim of, statement of mistaken identity. And so he wants to occupy his brand space. He wants to make sure the data is right because he, he finds it valuable, and I think he's right. So I think we all have to sort of understand that uh, this information is often incorrect, but by our own efforts, we can help to improve it. Yes, sir. Yes. Do you think there are cases where reasonable expectation of privacy applies to facts that can be either logically or statistically inferred by merging multiple public records? Good question. So this really gets to, and, and the answer is, you can definitely infer things that are uh, damaging from public data, right? Uh, I mean, it's, it's very easy, actually. The, my, my favorite example is prejudicial pricing, right? Uh, a site can find out you know, what age you are, what gender you are, what race you are, and they could show you prices based on that information. C complete illegal act, by the way. Uh, but there are some prejudicial pricing that's legal. First 20 in the door, get it, get it for free. That's prejudicial, right? First come, first serve, that's okay. But you're onto something really important, okay? In fact, at, uh, fr at February Strata Conference, I'm doing a, uh, a session with uh, Solon Barakas from NYU, and we're gonna talk to exactly this point, is like, uh, what data uses are problematic? In fact, Solon's doing his whole PhD thesis on uh, inappropriate, inferences from public data, okay? And, there, and I think that's where the action's gonna be. Because I think data, and I think the, the title of it is, uh, if data wants to be free, is privacy a prison? Because uh, I think it talks to, this don't, it talks to this idea of this don't ask, don't tell feeling that we as data engineers have that all this data is public, but what if someone can infer something bad from it? Then who, who's to blame here? In fact, Daniel, we are not talking before the talk about this. And I think that's where there's a lot of deep thought that has to happen. I think some uses should be regulated, probably. I mean, I can't imagine there's certain that, that some use cases won't find more regulation, but I think that's okay. I mean, there's a lot of use cases that are incredibly empowering. I think you come down to this, everyone knows there's baby and bath water in the tub. Nobody knows what percentage. Is it 90% baby, 10% bath water, or is it all bath water? and a little baby. You know, nobody knows how this data will be used, but I think if we are too proactive with hyper-regulation, I think you end up throwing away a lot of the benefits uh, uh, that some of this great data technology might bring to the fore. H having said that, I think you're gonna have some areas that are gonna need regulation that some people may be hurt. Okay, so just to follow, follow up on that, so you raised the point that there are some uses of Infer data that may be appropriate or inappropriate. What about the publicly accessible nature of data itself? For example, if facts A and B are both publicly accessible, do you think it's a reasonable assumption that any fact C that could be inferred from A and B should also be publicly accessible? Oh yeah, I do. I mean, because that's data access. Now the question is, if that if that fact C is misused, I mean, fact A and B can be misused. Now, there may be some, look, there may be some inferences that may be very, very sensitive. I could think of a few. Uh, I think there was a case actually uh, where someone's sexual orientation was discerned from public data. So, the, so that you can argue is a, is a, it could be a real misuse of those, of public data facts A and B, right? It, it may be, 
deemed by society that that is an illegal inference. Okay. It, 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 right, or, but it may just be tasteless. <laughs> it may be a tasteless in, in, in inference. It may be an in, unethical inference, or it may be okay. I, you know, I think as society, we got to have this debate around every single one of them. And you can't, I'm not going to, what you can't have is you can't say any inference C is okay or all inference C are not okay. That, I don't think we're going to get there. But I think many, many of them may be okay. Yes, sir. Um, thanks for your talk, Jim. Very interesting. Oh, sure. Um, uh, two, two things. One is, on the, on the case of sites like Intellius, where there's a lot of public information kind of pulled together, which pre-internet would have been very labor-intensive to get at, and now it's easy, and it's proliferated across multiple sites. Do you think that something like this sort of credit reporting regulations where there are you know, three major credit reporting agencies and people have a right to free access to that kind of, kind of what information is being published there. Is that kind of framework somewhere where you think, um, do I think that your yeah, industry would, would be a good thing for, uh, for? I, you know, I'm always of the opinion that regulation happens when good people do nothing <laughs> or good companies do nothing, like bad things happen when good people do nothing. And I think that's, that was one of the inspirations for this TrueRep product. Let's show people their information. And there was a lot of dissenters saying, really? They'll freak out. I'm like, so? It's their information. <laughs> it's out there. They should have, be able to view it. I think it's just a matter of time before they demand it. It's, if it's about me, I want to know. I don't want to be the last to know. I want to be the first to know. And so I think, to your point, I think if industry sat on their hands and did nothing, I think you would end up, in fact, not just would end up, there have been proposals in Congress to actually require exactly what you're proposing. That once a year, somebody should be able to get a free back on check, right, if it's you, right? I personally have no problem with that. I think that we're on the road to doing that without legislation, though, yeah. right? So the, 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 another thing you said sort of subtly along the way, um, and I think a lot of it, one of the issues is our vocabulary for talking about this stuff, mm -hmm. really poor. Um, so, you know, we tend to talk about public versus private, and you use the word discrete, and to me it's not public or private. There's a continuum there is, right. of, of stuff on there. Have you or do you know anybody who's done any work on trying to think about what that continuum is, what the various expectations are at each stage, and what the kind of regulation, regulatory frameworks for people's? There's been a lot of great research uh, uh, around uh, Helen Nissenbaum at NYU did this great uh, privacy and context. Uh, I know Dana Boyd's done a lot of work around how people act, uh, how they they hide in public. So at, so they're actually doing uh, private things in public. They're actually controlling situations in public. Uh, 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 we have two teenage son teenage, teenage sons and. They're on Facebook and they hide in public all the time, right? You, as a parent, you know they're speaking in code. You're not allowed to ask for the decoder, right? Right? Uh, uh, and and you know our our rule base has been in our household uh, is you know childhood is a prison sentence of 21 years and your mother's the warden and you can be on Facebook but you have to friend us and we're going to be watching you all the time, and that's our prerogative as parents, and those are the rules that we set out. Get that said, they hide from us right in front of our faces. And that's okay too. That's their job, right? You know, our job is to lay down the rules. Their job is to circumvent them and negotiate change. That's okay. Uh, and I think there's been a lot of great research done around this. I, I mentioned, you know, two researchers. Uh, there's, a whole, uh, there, there's a whole field of work that's going on here. Some really amazing work too. So I have two uh, futuristic questions. Uh, one, uh, I think I've, I've asked you before, but so w one of the interesting things that happened several years ago was uh, that Usenet had been a quasi-public, mostly transient space, with certain social, uh, certain expectations around privacy, but that when uh, search engines came into being, and more extremely when uh, a day job became uh, sort of part of Google, there was suddenly a world of uh, retroactive changing of the expectations around uh, privacy and the web in general is in that. In fact, I believe a lot of the data that's now available, it's not just that it's now possible to get that data, 
but that at the time that that data was perhaps provided, it was provided under different expectations of the kinds of inferences that could be made. So what happens the next time it happens? The second question, in case it's more interesting, is do you anticipate uh, movements to deliberately pollute the data stream as perhaps the only mechanism that people have if they want to create privacy for themselves in a world where surely they can't do it by hiding the information, so instead, much like your kids speaking in code, they obfuscate it by shoveling stuff on top of it. I don't know if there's a related question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the first question is, really, when do privacy expectations change? And your example of using that and moving to search engines is an example of when they changed. I think every time you, and maybe this is over the top, but did, you know, have we moved through a singularity uh, around social media? And uh, Jeff Jarvis has a new book, Public Parts, and I, 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 and I, I really found it enjoyable. Uh, he talks about this Gutenberg parenthesis. Uh, uh, I don't think he coined it. I think it was coined. And I don't remember who the reference was. But 500 years ago, before the printing press, uh, society was mostly verbal. Everything was mashed up verbally. Everybody learned verbally. Uh, 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 scribes and, and the elite are the only ones that actually put anything down on paper. Uh, and so it was a mashup world. Then you had the book and everything was very static uh, and, and published and, and, and was uh, curated. Uh, and now, just recently, you now have the end of that era where now everything is cut and pasted and mashed up again. And so I think you're using that example. I, I struggle to think, is that like the new normal or is that just an artifact of sort of moving through this 500 year singularity and people had an expectation of, hey, I didn't expect this would be out, and then, it, and then it's out. Uh, I think there's other, because I think now we all realize if you put it in on a wire, unless there are very, are, are there really strict privacy controls around it, it's probably gonna end up being public. So that's. I mean, this, this yeah. I find, there's actually a short story, I remember, where uh, somebody invents a, a camera, maybe Lytra is working on this, where you can look at any point in, in time, space, in the past. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't even know that it violates any of our, any of our uh, current scientific you know, understanding for that sort of thing to be possible. Certainly you could imagine that uh, the, there may be, uh, for example, let's say that in the future, I'll be able to detect from trace signatures that you were at a location. And it was a public act after yeah. when you were there. That's but it, you yeah. didn't imagine that you're, yeah. you would have left you know, it's interesting. It's, yeah, and is that okay? I mean, it's interesting because I, I ran a company, a voting company, online voting company, and I'm and I'm an advisor on Helos Voting, which is uh, uh, online voting technology that's open source. And the question always comes up is, uh, the crypto can't be broken now, but in 200 years, will I be able to find out how your grandfather voted and then persecute the grandchild for it? Mm. Right. I mean, because you're talking about governments with huge disparity of power, right? And so that always comes up as a discussion and, and it really pushes the crypto security limits to uh, security to the limits. Uh, so those are really interesting questions. Let me get to your easier question, which is your second question, which is what can I just noise up the channel? Right. Which uh, I think if you I think that's happening now, there's actually companies that try to noise up your channel for you uh, by putting, putting out a lot of good stuff. Uh, you know, I think that social media is really about mapping humanity online and the rituals online. And so promoting yourself, which you can add, which you can say is noising up the channel, is kind of human nature. And I think the public space has a vested interest in not letting you do that. Uh, uh, so there's going to be this tension there. Uh, I think anonyms, if you want to like take it to the next stage, I want to have a subliminal channel where I can communicate. I think those kinds of uh, experiences will continue to be supported and really should be supported. And just, but not just self-promotion, you can imagine that uh, if, you know, and I remember when somebody accidentally, well, accidentally, when somebody had tweeted, uh, I think she had just done an interview and, and said, oh, it's a dumb job, but they pay well. Right. And somebody then, you know, say, hey, actually, mm -hmm. you know, we, we do look at people's tweets. Uh, one of the things that people did in solidarity with her was to actually all tweet the same thing. Right, to hide her. And to hide her. That didn't work. I mean, yeah. Right. You can't really hide. But there is this, I mean, for example. But isn't that the same thing as your friends closing ranks around you? 
And isn't, is that the online equivalent to your friends closing ranks around you, which we've done for a thousand, thousands of years? But yet the mechanism was new, right? The ne mechanism was clever, yeah. right? I mean, that, that, that is, but what would be different is imagine that today reasonably, like if, if a search for uh, pedophiles, for example, turns somebody up, not only just done in, in a sort of a clear database somewhere, but, but right, right. Uh, just a regular search, uh, today that's the result of that may be pretty pre prejudicial. If somebody synthetically created a lot of pages that would match, it decreases the value of that signal. So actually, I'm thinking more of that kind of systematic pollution. It's equivalent to saying, I'll make sure you can't trust anything you read. Yeah, and I think the public space has some vested interest in if resisting that, right? I mean, you know, and I think you, that's gonna happen, right? I mean, that's what we're doing. We're running this huge experiment, right? Let, let nobody think anything else. No one has this wired, man, you know, it's all, we're all sort of pushing and pulling and, and people are gonna try that and you, know, you see it every day. That's why it makes this so fascinating. And companies that uh, are trying things and innovating and under-innovating and over-innovating and that's what the human experience is about. Yes, sir. Yes, from your perspective, do you think the government has more potential to be a defender of privacy rights or a threat to privacy <laughs> rights? I don't think the government has ever been a defender of privacy rights. <laughs> if they were, I don't think it would. I don't think uh, keeping the government out of our space would be in our constitution. So it, it's it's past history. If, if past history is any indication of future behavior, uh, I don't think that uh, we can count on the government to protect our privacy. I think that's why we we have it. Uh, we have some level of privacy explicitly uh, uh, coded in our in our in our country's constitution. I don't think anyone that, I don't think that's a popular notion actually, that, that we would expect the government to protect our privacy. In fact, uh, you look at the Electronic Communication Privacy Act and its renewal, and it's really just about how do we keep the government out of our business uh, in the next 25, 50, 100 years? Because there's encroachment, right? I mean, sec security and privacy or security and liberty are, are always at odds. And uh, we're trying to find that balance, right? I mean, if Secure, you know, security in its limit is, is a, is a straitjacket. Uh, and uh, and I, I think it's, I, I remember, you know, my dad always said, you know, if you want your car to last forever, Jim, just never drive it, keep it in the garage. And I think, I think liberty and, and security is the same way. If, if, you, if you want ultimate security and no liberty, let the government take care of your privacy for you. Anybody else? I mean, I, I don't know how we do, are on time, folks. I, you know, I don't want to run over. What's your flight? <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. L last question. How, how do you tell uh, genetically modified cones? How what? Genetically GM. Genetically modified organisms, GMOs. Uh, cone, cones versus the way ones. The, how do we how do we know the difference? Yeah, if you try to read the top spec, it's genetic. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Let, let's end a note that where I, I have no expertise. <laughs> well, thanks everybody. I appreciate uh, appreciate the time. <laughs>